Another example is to look at the, the situation where we have multiple sessions for each subject. So I introduced that very early on in the, the first talk about group analysis, and now here's how to actually set it up in the GLM. So I mentioned the fact that we are doing a level by level kind of analysis where we're passing up things between the different levels. Previously, we've looked at doing an analysis for each subject as the first level analysis and then the analysis at the group level, uh, either for a single group of, of those subjects or splitting those subjects into two different groups. When we've got multiple sessions for each subject, we are actually going to go to three levels rather than two. Our first level is going to be analysing what happens in a single session. And then our second level is going to be combining together the sessions for each subject. And the third level is going to be the kind of group level that we've just been looking at. Okay, so, so in this situation, we're going to have an example where we've got five subjects and they each have three sessions. And so the first level analysis is exactly the same as you've seen in the single subject case. You've got fMRI data, you're analyzing what's happening across that fMRI time series. So that's no different. When we get to this second level, then it becomes different because now what we're going to do is we're actually going to group together the sessions which are associated with each subject and we're just going to average them in this case. And so you can see the design matrix, easier to see in the graphical depiction on the right hand side, that what we've got is we've got five different EVs. We've got one EV per subject. And in each of those EVs, we've got three different values which are non-zero. Like, and we just associate ones with those. So we have one, 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 and then all zeros. And that block of ones is in a different place for each subject because of the order that we put things in. So in this case, we've ordered it such that inputs one, two, and three are the three sessions from subject one. Inputs four, five, and six are the inputs are the sessions from subject two, etc. Just by putting the ones in like that, we are giving, uh, we are calculating the average of what we would be seeing for that particular subject across the three sessions which we've got. If we had more than three sessions, or we had a variable number of sessions, we would just change how many of those entries we associated with it and made sure that we ordered our inputs um, sensibly and uh, systematically. So that's what the design matrix looks like. You can understand how that's taking the average from each of, for each of the different subjects. Then we need to set up contrasts and our contrasts are really, really simple. All we are doing is we are putting a single contrast on each subject. So contrast one is for subject one. It has a one for the EV1, which is associated with subject one, and zeros for the rest. Contrast two is for subject two. It has a one for EV2 and zeros for the rest, etc. So each of those contrasts now just tells me about the mean of one particular subject. And that's all this second level is trying to do, is just trying to average the sessions for each subject. And then when we get to the third level, it's actually in this case quite simple. We've got five subjects, they are one group, and so we're going to do exactly what we saw a few slides earlier. We've got a single group, we're doing a single group average. So this level is now no different from what we've seen before. It's exactly the same as what we would have done if we'd only had one session per subject. Because it's being fed by the values from the level below, we have one value per subject now because we've averaged the sessions. And so this level doesn't care that there were different sessions, it just sees data coming up to it as if there was one value per subject and was doing a single group average. If it wasn't a single group and there were multiple groups, you would just use whatever was appropriate at this level, considering that you had one value per subject. And so that that's really quite straightforward. The tricky part about doing this is that actually this second level, this middle level, we only had three sessions for each subject. And that creates one problem, in that if we were to do a fully mixed effects analysis, we would have a contribution to the variance coming from the very first level, the session level, where we're looking at the noise, which is in the MRI data, which we fed in. And then we would have a, a contribution from our final level, which is the between subject variance, which we've been modeling. But we would also have a contribution from the second level, which would be the between session variance within each subject. 
And if, if you had lots of sessions, that is the best analysis you could do. That would be the fully mixed effect solution. But typically we do not have many sessions per subject. In this case, we have three sessions. It's really unusual to have more than that, or certainly any substantial value more than that. And that's really not enough to estimate a variance well. And because of that, we're forced into doing fixed effects for that middle level. For the second level analysis, we have to choose fixed effects because otherwise the variance estimate is going to be so poor that it's going to just wipe out all of our analysis by being terribly ill-conditioned. But that's not as bad as it sounds because we're doing a fixed effects just for the between session component. And then when we get to the final level, the third level will actually then take into account any between session variance and attribute it to between subject variance. And so at the final level, we still do mixed effects across the number of subjects that we've got. So this example had a very small number of subjects so that we could illustrate the design matrices, but in practice, you would have many more. And so the third level, we do normal mixed effects. And only at this central level do we have to do fixed effects. And we're forced to do it. It's not something we want to do, but we're forced to do it just because of the numbers that we have. But it still works out well, and your final analysis is still a mixed effects analysis. So just be aware of that. This is the one instance where we are actually going to select fixed effects deliberately. And it's only because of this. And it means that when we get to our final level, we're still OK because we can do mixed effects at that point. Another thing to consider is what happens when you've got different variance contributions from effects that you know about, things which might be correlated with the thing that you're interested in measuring. So for instance, here's an illustration of what effect size would be. And we're really interested in, you know, does that effect size overlap with the, the negative part here significantly or not in order to see whether our mean is substantially positive or not. Anything that we can do to reduce that variation will have a substantial effect on our ability to actually find a significant result, even if the mean hasn't changed at all. And actually, one of the things that we can do, and we often do know, is that there are some other factors which are involved in our subjects and the way that we're setting up our experiment, which can be useful for explaining some of that variance. And that's what this is about. We can reduce that amount of variance by explaining it by other covariates. And a covariate is simply that, something which is related to what we're doing. There's some correlation and it can actually reduce the amount of unexplained variance. And it's the unexplained variance which is going to go into all of our stats, which is going to, to um, attribute it to the random fact. So in this instance, we have seven subjects in one group and we have some additional measurements it might be age it might be a disability score it might be re reaction time it could be all sorts of different things whichever is appropriate for the kind of experiment you're doing if these covariates one or more of them can explain variation then it's useful to put them into the model and what they can do is that it might be the case that you know for large effect sizes they were generally associated with people with fast reaction times slow effect, uh, low effect values, and so small effect sizes associated with slow reaction times, for instance. If that was the case, then putting that in would actually explain some of that variance, make them tighter, and we would get a, a better statistical result. Actually implementing this in the GLM is very straightforward. If we have a single group, then we would put in our group average, so EV1 would still just be a column, of, a column of one. So if we look at the graphical depiction on the right hand side, you can see EV1, the familiar thing that we've seen before, if we've got a single group, single group average, it's just all ones. EV2 is then the value of our covariate. If we had more than one covariate, we would have EV3 and EV4 and so forth. For each of the covariates that you put in, you just put the value of that covariate for each subject with one exception. There's one thing that you have to do before you enter it into the design matrix like this. And that is that you need to de-mean the value of that covariate. 
and that's because we don't want it to be related to the mean value that we're estimating in EV1. And so what we're going to do is we're going to demean it. And that's also going to mean that, that EV1 is going to tell us about what's happening at the average value of that covariant. Because our average value after demeaning is going to be zero. And so, for instance, if we had age, that would mean that the, the mean that we estimate would be the mean of that group at the average age. And if there was an age effect, if things got you know worse as people were older and better when they were younger, then that would be explained by the covariant. But our group mean would be interpretable as what's happening at the average age, not at age zero, which we don't care about. We don't want to extrapolate all the way back to age zero. And that would be what we would get if we did not demean. So by demeaning, we make sure that what we're doing is we're looking at how the covariant is changing things about the average of that group. And so it's really important to do that in order to get interpretable results back. In practice, all it means is that you have to have the set of values that you're interested in for that covariant. You have to calculate the mean over that whole set. You have to subtract that mean value from each value. So if you had a set of ages and somebody was age 70 and the mean of that group was age 60, then it would simply be 70 minus 60 would be plus 10 and that would be the value that you would put in for the covariate for that subject. If another subject was 55, then you would put in minus 5. They were 5 less than the average, which was 60. Here, our example is reaction time. So there's some average reaction time that we've subtracted away. And so the EV values you can see are plus 24, minus 18, minus 7, plus 5, etc. They are centered around 0. And that's what we expect after they've been demeaned. And that's something that you have to do prior to entering it into the GLM like this. Once you've done that, and you do it separately for all the different covariates that you wanted to enter into it, then you set up contrasts. If all you're interested in is the group mean, and you're simply using the covariates to explain away some of the variance, then contrast one is all that you would need here, which has a value of plus one on the group mean and zeros on all of the other covariates. So in this case, zero on EV2, but it would be on all the covariates, if that was the case. If you're interested, however, in the relationship between your covariate and your activation. So in this case, we've got reaction time. And when we want to know, oh, how are they related? Is there actually a strong correlation between reaction time and the fMRI activation that I'm seeing? I can answer that in very easily with the same GLM. All I do is I set up a different contrast, in this case, contrast two, where I have zero on the group mean and plus one on the reaction time. That's actually going to look for positive correlations. If I want to look for negative correlations, then I would put a minus one on that reaction time, on EV2. And so that's how we would look for correlations as well. So the covariates can either be covariates of no interest, and we have a zero on them, like we have in contrast one, or they can be the thing that we're really interested in. And that's what we would do for contrast two. And we can actually ask both questions within the same analysis as we've got here. And so finally, I just wanted to talk about a few things that you'll see when you do group analysis within the FSL software using FEET. So the first thing that you'll need to do is to change actually the, the type of analysis that you're doing. So you see that there's a pull down menu right at the top, which switches you from first level analysis, which you should have done before, to higher level analysis now. And that's the, the essential thing that you have to do. And then you need to input your data, which is most conveniently done by specifying a range of first level feed directories so that it can extract all of the useful information. One of the things it will do at the very beginning of your higher level analysis is actually to apply the registrations that it's already done to resample all of the statistical images into standard space. So the registrations which are normally done in the first level don't apply the transformations. They don't do the resampling at that point. It's done at the beginning of the higher level analysis. And so you'll see it will create things like a reg standard directory. And you'll see in, in images being created in standard space when you have a look at the directory later. And that's important because we need to pass up things like the cope image and the var cope image and they need to be in standard space. When you have finished running your group analysis, you, the output will be in a .g feed directory rather than just in a standard feed directory. And you'll actually get different 
analyses done for every contrast that you specified in the lower level one. So in the lower level one, if you had a couple of different EVs and you specified simple contrasts, one for each of those versus baseline, and then maybe a difference contrast between the two, then you would get three group analyses done. One would be for the contrast, which was just on one of the EVs, one of the conditions. One would be an analysis done on the second EV or the second contrast, and another one for the third contrast, the difference between them. You can restrict that too, but just be aware that, that that is what's going to happen by default. And that's actually quite useful. You can see what the group average is, say, for one particular condition versus baseline. You can see what the group average would be for the second condition versus baseline and the group average for the difference of those two conditions. Or it might be that your higher level analysis is not just a group average, it's a group difference or a pair t-test. Whatever it is, it's going to repeat it for each of the different lower level contrasts that you specified. So in summary, we've seen a range of different examples of different types of group level analysis. Seeing what to do in a single group, what to do when we've got a couple of different groups which are unpaired data, what to do when we've got paired data, so multiple things, particularly two different values for each subject in the paired t-test, what to do when we've got multiple sessions for each subject and we have multiple levels then, we have three levels instead of the two, or when we've got covariates, either covariates which are covariates that are, we're really interested in because we want to know the relationship between that particular variant and the bold signal that we're measuring or the covariates of no interest. They're just explaining variation um, which helps us to be more precise about the other things that we're interested in such as the group average. These are specific cases so you've seen specific examples for specific numbers of, of uh, subjects in different groups but actually it all generalizes from the basic principles. So if you understand the basic principles that they're all based on, then generalizing it to larger numbers, you know, more instances, different levels, that can all be done relatively straightforwardly. These are the most fundamental concepts to, to get a handle on. And they cover a vast majority of the kinds of analyses that people do. When you're doing your group level analysis, remember that the inputs have to be ordered and you're actually responsible for deciding what order those inputs are going to have. So they're going to be typically be different subjects. And you want a systematic ordering and you need to remember what that is because that's going to be crucial for how you set up your design matrix and how you interpret the results of the, the contrasts that you've got. Fixed effects, as I said, is something that we don't normally use, but we do use it in one specific instance, which is the second level when we've got multiple sessions. And that's due to the low number of sessions that we normally have per subject. If we had lots of sessions, we wouldn't need to do that, but typically we have only a handful of sessions, and so we have to use fixed effects at that point. But then we would do mixed effects at the final level, and that then gives us results which generalize to the population. And then finally, importantly, if you're using covariates, whether they're covariates of interest or covariates of no interest, you must demean the values before they go into the GLM. And that's an important thing to do because that really helps with the interpretation of what you get out.